You're listening to the weekly Parsha podcast, recorded with Hashem's never-ending assistance in Ramavich Hamish Israel, 5776-2016. This week we don't have a Parsha because we have the holiday of Passover, of Pesach. So this week, and also next week, for those who are in Chutzlar, it's outside of Israel, we are going to be reading readings that have to do with the concept of Passover, of Pesach itself. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you some thoughts about Pesach, and hopefully we'll have something that we can take with us through the holiday, something that will inspire us. It's important to note, as we look at the Jewish calendar, as we look at the holidays that we go through, everything is set up in such a way that it's very orderly. There's a very clear structure to what's going on. And the structure very much has to do with the fact that there are six months and six months. We have 12 months in a year, generally. Sometimes we have a 13th month, not for our discussion right now. But generally speaking, we have six months that go from Nisan through through the end of Elul, and then we have Tishrei through the end of Adar. So these six months parallel each other. So Nisan is the month that we're in now. It's the month of Pesach, of Passover. Tishrei is the month that we'll be in in six months from now, which is the month when we have the holidays of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. The Gemara tells us, in a, in a number of different places, that we have a connection between the holiday of Pesach and the holiday of Sukkot. And that connection, the way that it's described, is as a gzir shav, a connection. We have the same word in the context of Passover as in the context of Sukkot in the Torah, in the, in the description within the Torah. And that is the word the 15th, because both of these holidays occur on the 15th of the month. And that's very significant because the 15th of the month is the very middle of the lunar month. And in the middle of the lunar month, the, the moon is full. And so that expresses the idea or that brings out the fact that in the middle of the month, the spiritual realms that we experience, the, the world that we experience, reflects at the, in the most possible way, just like the moon is reflecting fully what it can reflect of the sun's light, so too we are reflecting the spiritual realms. So it's significant that Sukkot and Pesach both occur in the middle of the month on the 15th, and it's significant that they're connected through this passageway, so to speak, through this word, these words of the 15th of the month, Chamishasar, Chamishasar. Now, in thinking about the comparison between Sukkot and Pesach, so these two holidays, because they're connected in this way by the Torah, and because of the fact that, that we find them in the middle of the first month of these two six-month series, means that we can look at them through this connection, and we can say that there are some kind of parallel. There are many different parallels, but I want to focus in on one specific parallel, which has to do with the mitzvahs themselves, the particular commandments that we find in each of these holidays. On Sukkot, the commandments that we have are the commandment to build and walk into our sukkah, to live our lives within that sukkah, to eat there, to sleep there, etc. And we also have the mitzvah of lulav. We have the commandment to, to bring these four different species, to shake them in the, in the different directions. There's a lot of movement, a lot of motion. We also have the fact that on Sukkot, we go around the bima, we surround it, we walk around with our lulavim and esrogim. We also do this action on Shemini Atzeres, on the eighth day of Sukkot. And we, we walk around the, the bima with the Sefer Torah, we dance, etc. So we see that when it comes to Sukkot, there's a lot of action on our part. There's a lot of movement. We're building that sukkah. We're walking into that sukkah. We're shaking that lulav. We're dancing with the Torah. A lot of movement. But when it comes to Pesach, it's very interesting because the mitzvahs of Passover involve eating. They involve, we, yes, there's an action that we do, but after we take that action, we eat this food. It's consumed and it's gone. When we finish with the, the lulav and the esrog, it's still there. It's, still, it's not consumed. What's the significance of the fact that there's so much motion around the holiday of Sukkot? There's so much movement. But when it comes to Passover, there's almost like a, a stopping of movement. That's the way it seems. It seems like we're not moving so much. Also very interesting is the fact that we find that when it comes to Sukkot, so we have this special eighth day, which is called Shemini Atzeres. And there's a Medrash, which I've quoted in the past, that talks about the fact that Really, Shemini Atzeres, the eighth day of Sukkot, should have been 50 days later. Just like we count 50 days from the second day of Passover until Shavuos, when we receive the Torah, and then we have a separate holiday of Shavuos, 50 days later, on the sixth day of, of Sivan. So too, it should have been that way in regards to Sukkot. We should have had a holiday 50 days later on the sixth day of Kislev, but that's not what we do. In fact, what we do is that we have it on the eighth day, we have it immediately, we have that eighth day, that Shemini Atzeres, Shavuos, 
is also called Atzeres. It's a day of stopping. After we've gone through a certain process, we stop. That's why it's called Atzeres. What is the significance of the fact that we have Shmini Atzeres, that eighth day where we dance with the Torah? So it's clearly all about the Torah. What is the significance of the fact that it's immediate? As opposed to on Pesach, where we have an Atzeres as well. 50 days later, we sit and we learn the Torah. And, but that's happening 50 days later. Why is it indeed that it takes more time to get there? Also significant, why on Shemini Atzeres do we dance with the Torah? There's this movement, like we said, in regards to Sukkot, there's movement, there's dancing, there's shaking, there's building. But when it comes to Shavuos, the way that we encounter the Torah is not with a dance, but rather it's with sitting all night and studying the Torah and preparing ourselves to receive the Torah, but it seems like in a more passive way. What's the understanding of this contrast between Sukkot and Pesach, between Shemini Atzeres and Shavuos? Another thing that's worth thinking about is the fact that we find that on Sukkot, there's no Seder. On Pesach, we have a Seder, we sit down with our children, we tell the whole story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, of the exodus from Egypt, and we have a whole process, and we give it over to our kids. But on Sukkot, there's not really such a process. What's the difference? Why on Sukkot is it not as focused on giving over, on Mesora, the giving over the tradition to our children? But on Pesach, it is indeed. What's the understanding of that? So to begin to understand what's going on, I'd like to share with you the idea that there are two different modes of service of Hashem. Or, said differently, there are two different modes of our experience of spirituality, of godliness, of our relationship with Hashem. One possible way of experiencing that is a more ecstatic way. It's where we, we work ourselves up, we dance, we sing, and we have really an awesome experience of the spiritual realm perhaps, or of our relationship with Hashem, or our relationship with others. That's one way, and that's one mode of service of Hashem. And that's something that we see in the Hasidic world more. It's something that we see that people, certain people indeed need to have that kind of relationship with Hashem, or their, or relationship to spirituality. But there's another mode. And that mode is through more is, is a more thoughtful mode. It's a more measured mode. It's a more metered mode. And in that mode, in the second mode, so the person develops his relationship with Hashem or his relationship with spirituality or his relationship with Torah in a more measured way, in a building way, in a slower way. It's not as ecstatic. It's not as awesome. It's not as inspirational. But it, it's something that lasts longer. It's something that's a little bit deeper in a certain way. Each one of them has their mila. Each one of them has their advantage. Sometimes a person needs inspiration, but sometimes a person needs to settle down in order to receive that more measured and calm, so to speak, relationship with Hashem. And I think that if we look at the difference between Sukkot, which is in Tishrei, the beginning of the year, which is the fall, so that time of year, things are more dark. Our connection to Hashem is not as open. It's not as obvious. Everything is starting to, the, you know, all of the plants, they're not opening up like it is in the spring. In the spring, everything is manifest. There's much more light. It's warmer. Everything about the spring is much more open, much more connected. And that's a reflection in the physical realm of what's going on in the spiritual realms. In the fall, however, everything is much darker. Everything is much cooler. Things are moving into a different mode. They're moving into the winter mode. And so in that place, in that space, when we're in that darkness, when we're in that place where we don't openly see Hashem as much, so in that place we need more movement. We need more motion. We need to do something greater to experience a revelation, to experience inspiration, to experience a connection to Hashem. And in that space also, because of the fact that it's darker, because of the fact that it's colder, so to speak, so it's much easier to lose it. So it's something that has to be done quickly. You have to run and jump and, and dance with the Torah. You have to shake that lulav. You have to move. You have to build that sukkah. You have to get, get yourself moving in order to have a relationship with Hashem. When we get to the spring, however, because the light is much more prevalent, because it's much more obvious, because it's much more available, so it's something which, if I take too much, I'll be overwhelmed with it. I need to take it in a much more measured way, in a more metered way. And not only is it something which I must do, but it's something that I have an opportunity to do, to slow down because there's so much light. It's an opportunity for me to receive it in a much deeper way. Now, what's interesting is, one of the minhagim that we have, one of the customs that the Jewish people has, is that we save our lulav and esrog, from, all the way from Sukkot. We save it, and we include the lulav and esrog in the burning of the chametz. When we burn that chametz, 
when we burn all the leavened stuff, so we get rid of that, so we only are eating matzah. All we have in our houses is matzah. There's no bread left. There's not a crumb left in our homes. What's the significance of the fact that part of the burning, one of the things that we use to kindle the burning of the chametz is indeed the lulav and the hadasim and the other things that are the components of the arba minim, that which we shook six months ago, or in this case, in, this, in our year, because it's a leap year, seven months ago. So the simple explanation is that we want to use one mitzvah to help us do another mitzvah. But I think that there's another deeper idea here that's going on. And that is that there are two different modes of serving Hashem which are reflected in two different times of year. And we can say it's reflected in the different types of people within Klal Yisrael. But the two different modes are one is an ecstatic greater inspired service of Hashem that involves movement, that involves dancing, that involves song as we had at Sukkot. Sukkot is Zman Simchaseinu. It's a time of greater joy, but it's a time when we need greater joy. We need greater inspiration. We need that extra movement in order to feel connected to Hashem as we go into the winter months. But as we get to Pesach, there's a different mode. When we get to Nisan, when we get to the spring, there's a different mode because the light is more available, because access to Hashem is more obvious. And we can't stay in that mode. We need to, in a certain sense, burn up that mode. We need to take the Lulav and the Esrog and we need to put it in the fire with the Chametz. Because the Chametz represents a certain level of ego. It represents a certain level of neediness on the part of our emotional selves, our animal selves. And that is for that food, for that thick bread, which represents the Seor, Sheba Isa, represents the, you know, the leavening of the bread, represents our Yetzar, our evil inclination, our animal desires. When it comes to Pesach, we need to come down from, even from that inspiration that, you know, when, when we're inspired, when we're dancing, so there's a movement, there's an involvement of our physical selves in our Avodah Hashem, in our service of God. And that's important, and that's one mode of being. That's one mode of serving Hashem. But there's another mode. And so in this, when we're in this time, we need to give up that mode. In a certain sense, we need to burn that mode. And we need to move into the new mode, the new modality, which is where we are serving Hashem in a, in a qu- more quiet place, in a more meter place, a more measured place, where we're eliminating the ego. And it's not something that we can stay in all the time. It's not a mode that's for all the time. But it's for now. It's where we are at this time. It's where we are when we come to Pesach, when we come to Passover, when we come to Nisan, when we come to the spring. Because to receive this great light is something that has to be done in a more measured way. And that is why when it comes to Shmini Atzeres, we have to have that, that ecstatic day, that receiving of the Torah, that dancing with the Torah has to be immediate because we have to hold on to it before we lose it. It's something which only comes, it's inspired, and then that's it. It's dark again. But in our time, in the time of the spring, in the times of Pesach, of Nisan, so the inspiration is something which is open. It's more manifest. And so we have this time where we get to build up to receive it. And so we have the counting of the Omer. We don't have to have that ecstatic day immediately because the light is here. It's readily available. But we still need to make ourselves in a measured way we count. One day, two day, three day, four, five, six, seven, one week. And then we count again. We count slowly up to receiving the Torah. And even when we receive the Torah, it's not in this massive dancing ecstatic form, but rather it's in sitting, learning the Torah, receiving the Torah, in in a more passive way, in a more metered way, and with less ego. You know, on Sukkot, there's no Pesach Seder. There's no, we don't sit and talk about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt. But what we do do is that we represent, we, we behave in a way which is spiritual. And that's something that our children, you know, when you see something ecstatic, inspiring, so, you know, you're inspired. It's something that sticks with you. It's something that makes an impression. So, yes, we are indeed interacting with our kids we are indeed giving them something inspiring but it's in a different it's a different way it's a more inspired way perhaps but it's not something that's metered and measured when we get to Pesach when we get to Passover we're slowing down we're sitting down we're taking the time just like on Shuas we stay up all night to study the Torah we we take the time so too on Pesach we stay up all night to take the time to talk about this amazing experience that we had, but we're looking at it in a more measured way and with less ego, with less inspiration perhaps, with less ecstatic type of interaction with God. But it's a different mode, it's a different way of teaching. The mitzvahs of Sukkot involve motion, involve movement, involve building, involve dancing. So there's that motion. But 
on Pesach, the mitzvahs involve something which is consuming. I'm eating up this food. I am, I'm eating the matzah. I'm e- it's becoming part of me. It's, it's something which has less movement, less motion, and it becomes absorbed into me. There's much more of an incorporation of the actual mitzvah itself into myself on a physical level. What's interesting is that in the Torah, when it talks about the month of Nisan, it tells us, and it's the first mitzvah of the Torah, it says, HaChodesh HaZelachem, this is your month, Kal Yisrael. This month, the month of Nisan, is your month. Do you want to know how the Jewish people survived throughout millennia of persecution, of difficulties, of holocaust, of inquisitions, etc.? How did we survive? It's through the fact that we had this measured, this ability to stay in a measured mode, in a metered mode, you know, we have a setback, we move forward slowly. We, we have an inspiration, we move forward slowly, we receive it. We work through the process. Here we are, Kal Yisrael, the Jewish people still exists after 3,300 years of history, really more, 3,700 years of history. Here we still are. Why? Because we've absorbed the message of Nisan. The message of Nisan is, take it one step at a time. One day at a time. We're counting one day at a time and then a week at a time from Pesach until Shavuos. That's how you receive the Torah. That's how you remain as a nation. And that's why we give over. We have a Seder where we sit down with our children. This is the time of Mesorah, a tradition. We give it over to our children. We show them that this is something which requires a measured approach. We have to do this slowly. We have to do this properly. We have to take it and we have to receive it. In order to receive it, we need to do it in this specific way, in the mode of Nisan. Klal Yisrael has returned to the land of Israel in our times. Unbelievable miracle. And how did we get here? Through perseverance. Through constantly remembering every single day. God returned to Jerusalem. Our focus, our prayers are always to Jerusalem. It's this metered and measured slow willingness. Come back, return, return to Eretz Yisrael, return to the land of Israel. That all occurs in this time. Between Pesach and Shavuos, we have this recognition of the fact that here we are, back in Israel, back in our land, because of the patience that we had for so many thousands of years, and remembering throughout this time, and giving over to our children, L'shon HaBab Yerushalayim, every single year we say, next year in Jerusalem, it's going to be, it's going to be soon. And as we remember that, as we give that over to our children, we need to realize, we need to remember, we need to incorporate into ourselves that how does this occur? How do we return to Eretz Yisrael? It's through the mode of Nisan. It's through the mode of patience. It's through the mode of sitting, doing the work, going through the process, and then we return. That's how we get L'shona Habab Yerushalayim. Don't, we don't say this year in Jerusalem because we recognize that it's next year, that it's through the process of what we're going to go through over the next 12 months that we're going to move closer and closer to Jerusalem, to returning to Israel. I want to bless you and please bless me back. Hashem should help us to incorporate, to absorb the message of Nisan, the message of the idea that we are in a process. And in order to receive the amazing light of redemption that Hashem wants to give us, we need to go through that process. We need to receive it. And it's a step at a time. Yes, it starts six months earlier or seven months earlier in Tishrei with that inspiration. But the way that we ultimately truly receive it is through the metered and measured process. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful Shabbos and a wonderful Pesach. This podcast was made possible through the gracious donations of listeners like you. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.arigoldwag.com or search on iTunes, Ari Goldwag.